I have an idea, I turn it into a product of some sort, I put it into the market faster than the other guys. That's how startups win nine times out of 10. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Business Model Canvas uh, Entrepreneurship 101 lecture with Mark Zimmerman, one of our team members here at Mars, who has watched the distribution lecture from, I guess, would be two years ago now, so maybe not that many that Mark Zimmerman did. You want to see that? Ah, we got a loyal, we got a loyal follower. So Mark Zimmerman has previously in the past uh, given our distribution lecture. He did a really fantastic presentation that I saw on Business Model Canvas uh, to a different group. So I wanted to steal him and switch him over to a new lecture because I think he does a really great job explaining um, business model and the business model canvas. By way of his experience, he has worked for big companies like Bell and AT&T, but he's also worked for a number of startups, including Netcom, Next Air, which was sold to RIM and Connected In which was actually a client of Mars. So he's been working in the information and communication technology industry for more than 15 years. And he's been on the big company side, but also on the entrepreneurial side. So Mark is, a, uh, is the CIO of Mars, as well as being an advisor in our ICE practice. So he uses his experience to help Mars clients in the areas of B2B enterprise software and SaaS business models, as well as in security and privacy. So with that, we welcome Mark Zimmerman. Thank you so much for coming today and for uh, giving me your attention. I'm going to talk to you today about something that I'm really passionate about, a tool that I have found in our advisory work at Mars is potentially transformative uh, for, for entrepreneurs. Um, it's really an exciting topic that I'm uh, very thrilled to be uh, able to present to you. So it's called the Business Model Canvas. Um, and I thought I'd start, because I'm a technology guy, and I've been a technology guy since the 90s. It's the rigor that I give you a Dilbert cartoon. Um, so as requested, I wrote the business plan to show pro profitability by year three. There's an armored car going to crash through the wall and spill money on us, and don't stand where the comet is assumed to strike. I had the, uh, the privilege of working with an entrepreneur who teaches now at uh, the Richard Ivey School of Business, a guy named Ron Close, who used to say when we were writing business plans uh, together, um, this is where the miracle happens. In the chart that you have, the miracle happens here on your, on your business plan. And uh, that's one of the flaws of the traditional business plan. Um, I think next, next week, uh, um, at our next session, uh, Victoria, uh, Veronica Latinsky is going to talk to you about the business, business plan, the traditional business plan, the sort of the 192 pages of unchanging, um, unlikely to be updated document that uh, you write for venture capitalists or that you write for, for your banks and, and those kind of things. Business Model Canvas is not that. Your sole advantage as a startup in winning against the competition, in winning against the bigger companies, the better funded companies, the more experienced, more um, better armed, better equipped, the ones who have the customers already, is speed through this cycle process, right? Through, I have an idea, I turn it into a product of some sort, I put it into the market, I learn something, and I cycle through that loop faster than the other guys. Um, that's, that's how startups win nine times out of 10. Um, and the Business Model Canvas is a tool that hopefully will help you cycle through that loop faster. That's its, that's its mission. Um, that's, that's why I think it's um, such a potentially important tool for, for you as entrepreneurs. Um, this is the alternative. 20-some um, inches of um, a business plan. How many of you have written a business plan? Um, how many of you, once you wrote the business plan, looked at it again? You know, sort of dusted it off and updated it when the assumptions changed? How many of you are lying? Um, you know, this is, this is a, a process, at least in my experience, you write the business plan, um, you go out into the world, you test those assumptions, and maybe annually, you know, you, you go back and you dust it off and you say, okay, we thought the market was this, we thought our, you know, our, we're going to be small business people from one to five uh, employees, turned out to be five to eight. Um, turned out that they, you know, we thought they were in this vertical, turned out they were in that vertical. Um, it's very rare in my experience working with entrepreneurs uh, as an advisor here, as a board member of startups, that those documents are living documents. And uh, as, as entrepreneurs, 
you need a way to keep track of all of the things that change. And you know, almost always in a business plan, in my experience, nine out of 10 of those pages are wrong. Um, they're, they're, not, they're not uninformed. They were, they were smart things when you wrote them. They were, they were the right facts and evidence at the time. But they, you know, they, they didn't survive collisions with the real world. Um, and uh, business plans don't tend to be updated. And so we hope that the business model canvas is a tool that's lightweight enough that it, it's sort of deep enough that it captures all of the important things about your business, but it's lightweight enough that it doesn't present significant barriers to updating and keeping it live and keeping it as a breathing document. So let me walk you through the piece parts of it in a, in a little bit of detail, and uh, we'll go from there. So these are the, the structures. There's nine boxes on that page. It's deliberately one page. Um, Alexander Osterwalder, who is the fellow who, uh, who came up with this model, evolved out of a PhD thesis that, uh, that he wrote, very deliberately kept this to one page. The sizes of the boxes are important and are deliberate. You know, they, they, they're intended to um, instill discipline about the um, amount of content, about the, the relative importance of those things as, as you go through them. And so they're, they're very deliberate, and let's, let's look at each of them in turn. Very first one is your customers. Uh, you know, the whole reason we have a business is to serve some kind of customer segment. So this box is who do you serve? Who are you for? Right in this, uh, you know, in this in this segment on the page, who you're for. And ideally, um, have you guys talked about customer segmentation yet? Have you talked about target markets? Has that been a topic that's been covered here? No. All right. So um, I obviously won't dive into that in in any in any significant detail um, this evening, but. Important that that segment be actionable. You know, I was talking earlier about in, uh, in, in updating a business plan, you know, it's small business. A small business is not an actionable segment. A small business that's one to five people who have this pain, who are in this vertical. You need them to be addressable, and you need them to be self-referencing. You know, sort of people who say, hey, that's someone like me, so that I can market to them in bunches. Um, so who do you serve? Who is your product or service or solution for is the first box here. And what problem do you solve for them is the second uh, box that generally you fill out in this model. So what are you doing? You know, what problem are you solving? Another way to think about that um, is, uh, how many are familiar with Clayton Christensen? Um, he has a model very worth uh, digging into a book, a number of books that are, that are worth reading. Um, and he has a, a, a mental model of, what job do you do for the customer? What are they hiring you to do for them? Um, you know, uh, the, probably the, the most famous uh, analogy for that is nobody buys a drill. People buy holes, right? I mean, it's holes that you want, um, not drills. Um, I want a 1 8 inch hole, not a 1 8 inch drill bit. So what job are you solving is what you want to write in here in the what job do you do part of, uh, part of, this, uh, part of this model. Next thing is channels. Um, how do customers find you? Um, you know, how do they know about the product that, uh, that, that you are offering is the next question. And that's uh, also about, hey, once I found out about it, how do I buy it? And those can be two different things, of course. You can market, in a, you know, market on television and then fulfill that uh, product delivery in a, in a website or in a, in a retail environment. And then how do you deliver the product? Again, that can be a third answer to that question. Uh, but all of them are channel questions. All of them are things that need to show up in your channel part of your model. What type of relationship do you have with the end customer is the next thing that we want to capture on this, on this document. Um, and you know, and relationships with customers vary wildly. Um, you know, I have a very transactional relationship with my gas station. Um, I'm not in love with Esso. I don't, you know, um, I don't, uh, I don't refer my friends. It's not something that I, you know, I, I would say I have a deep relationship with. I ideally want to get in and out of that relationship as quickly as as possible. Um, I have a very different relationship with my local coffee shop. Um, you know, it's a it's a much more intimate relationship. It's a, uh, an organization that you know, I'm passionate about and that I would tell my friends about. And both of those are valid business answers you know, from a business model perspective to the, to the question. You don't need to, in every business, aspire to be somebody that the customer loves or is, you know, is, is particularly attached to. It's the right relationship for me to have a transactional relationship with some, um, some, of, some of my suppliers. So think hard in your, in your business model about what type of relationship you aspire to have with your, with your customer base. Um, 
better figure out a revenue stream? Where does the cash register go in, uh, in, in, the, in the business that uh, you're thinking about as the next thing on your canvas is box five? Um, lots of business school uh, uh, colleagues of mine and folks that I, they see say this is box one. Um, in the vast majority of startups, I think it's uh, you know, the most important thing is to think about value creation first and then think about where value capture goes. So I think that's an outmoded mode of thinking. And I think you know, it being the fifth box is the right answer to this question. But uh, don't be surprised if you use the business model canvas to communicate to investors or to board members and, you know, and so on that uh, they, they want to talk about this box first. Um, resist the urge to let them um, you know, take you um, in that direction first. The next thing is, what things do I have to do in order to fulfill that value proposition? What are the key activities for, for my business? And this is not meant to, and it's, it's deliberately a small box, this is not every activity. Um, the fact that you need uh, office it doesn't go in this box. The fact that you need phones doesn't go in this box. The fact that you need um, you know, an office administrator doesn't go in this box. These are the essential activities to delivering the value proposition. What are the, what are the absolute key activities on this list? And if you've got more than three or four in that box, think harder. Um, narrow this down. You know, this is meant to be a startup. Um, you're resource constrained. You're, you're, you, you need to think really deliberately about what's going to go in this box um, before, um, you know, before writing it in there. Uh, what things must you do? Sorry, a, a build that I missed there. Um, next thing, your key resources. What resources do you need to execute on those activities? And they are only the resources, again, that you need to do the activities that you must do. Not every person, not every dollar, not every part of the business model. What are the essential ones? What are the differentiated ones? What are the ones, um, one test that I use often for technology startups is to say, if your CTO went away, went away then this is a technology business. You know, they, they belong in that, in that box, in the key resource box, if, if that's true, if, it's, if, if that if your key developer goes away and the business continues, then they're not a key resource. You know, they don't belong in that, in that business. These are the essential things um, in the box. Um, key partners, what else or who else do you need to make the model work? Um, you know, what other partners, what other suppliers, what other relationships, what other contracts do you need in order to deliver the value proposition? So those are the, the boxes there. And then the last one, of course, is what, is all, what do all these things cost? Um, what does it cost me to operate um, this business? What are the costs of those key resources? And we're, we're interested in here in not so much, again, every cost item, but which are the, the key levers? Which are the ones where these costs scale as my business scales? So if you're making, uh, you know, making widgets, these are the costs the, that, that come off your gross margin, you know, that come off of the business as it scales. They're the, the ones that are, that are levers in your profitability, not every cost again, you know, not, the, not the beginning costs. So altogether, those things aim to answer these questions. Who um, am I serving? What am I doing for them? How am I doing it? And of course, why am I doing it? Why being the difference between the revenue stream and the cost structure is the why you're here. Um, you know, it's that one minus that one equals the reason that uh, your business is, is built. And uh, how many of you have social purpose businesses or are thinking about double bottom lines, uh, triple bottom lines rather, uh, you know, for your, for your business? So um, totally appropriate and works equally well on this model to add on the, on the bottom of it where these are important to your model, the social and environmental costs and the social and environmental benefits as, a, you know, as an overlay or as an additional set of columns on that cost structure and, and revenue stream. Um, and uh, we've seen some great uh, um, you know, business model innovation in that, in that area that uh, is, is, is pretty easy to capture in a, in a model like this. Um, so that's the framework. Um, I've gone very fast through the framework on, on purpose because I want to walk you through a very quick case study of a business, and then I want to show it to you in the canvas. I think it will make a whole lot more sense if you see an actual business than if I talk to the blank boxes. So uh, bear with me while I set a little context about a business, and then uh, we'll go from there. So how many people know what those are? All right, those are Nespresso capsules. Um, 
And uh, the one person who saw my distribution lecture knows that this is a particular favorite case study of mine for pivot, you know, for sort of the changing your business model as, uh, as, as you go along. So those are Nespresso capsules. That's a Nespresso machine. How many of you own one of those? Um, how many of you had, how many of you have drunk one, you know, been and had Nespresso coffee? Cool. All right. So I think this will, um, will be a, you know, fairly relatable example um, for you as, as you as you think about a startup. So this thing was invented in 1970, that the Nespresso capsule was invented. Um, took them a while to perfect it. Once they had it per perfected, they patented it in 1976. And in 1986, they launched the product, um, sold it to restaurants and offices. And the idea was, um, don't buy any equipment. Don't, uh, you know, don't, don't buy the capital. Um, we pay us by the glass. You know, pay 50 cents per cup of coffee um, that is sold in your, in your restaurant. And uh, the thought process or the value proposition was training staff how to make a good, you know, a good espresso was difficult. Stocking the stuff was difficult. Cleaning the machines was difficult. Let us simplify this stuff. We'll save your waiter or waitress you know, three minutes in the process. They'll be more efficient. We'll get the people through the restaurant. And this will work really well. This was the, the value proposition that uh, Nespresso went to, went to market with. Um, 1988, a couple years into that experiment, they said, uh, not working so good. Um, really not happy about this. Um, the only thing that kept them from shutting the business down is they'd made a lot of capsules. And uh, they thought, OK, well, we'll go until, you know, we'll continue this experiment until we run out of capsules. We'll stop the production line. We'll stop making more. Um, but we might as well try and sell the ones we got. Um, and in the course of that process, they put a, put, a, put a person in charge of it from the organization named J.P. Gilliard. And he said, eh, I'm not accepting this. The job that they gave him was you know, sort of manage this thing um, until we shut it down and then sell the, you know, sell the assets um, and uh, see what you can get for the, you know, for the factories, for the machines, for the, for the IP. And he said, no, nah, I'm going to try something else. Um, and the brainstorm that, that he had was separate the machine and the capsules. Um, take those things and think of them as solving different jobs for, for, the, for the consumer. He said, we're going to forget about being in the machine business. We're not good at this. It's not our core strength. We're a coffee company. We're good at making coffee, finding it, roasting it, uh, you know, creating the beans. Um, but we're going to outsource the making and servicing of the machines. We're also not going to sell them. Um, you know, we were selling them directly. We had a sales force. We were going to all of those stores. We're not going to do that. We're going to put them in high street kind of retail stores and uh, let the Hudson's Bay Company sell them instead of us. Um, the manufacturers, the Philipses of the world, who were the first guys that uh, they convinced to, to, to take on this model with them, are going to manufacture it. They're going to worry about stocking it. They'd had a lot of problems with, hey, we don't know how to keep these things on the shelves. Uh, they sold well in some stores. They sold awfully in others. And, uh, and they had inventory problems. The only thing we're going to keep control of in the machine part of the business is the training of the salespeople. Um, that we're going to make sure that they know how to create a proper espresso. You know, and uh, in an espresso machine, that's not a difficult job. Um, if you can push the button, you can achieve this. Um, but we're going to make sure that they understand the messages around that pushing of the button and that they, they do that well. The capsules, though, we're going to sell those. Those are our business. Um, in fact, we're going to forbid the retailers from selling them. They can give them away. We'll give you a starter pack in the initial model with the machine, but you can't go buy more there. You know, you can't buy more at the store. Um, not allowed. Um, the only way you're going to buy more is by joining our club. Um, you're going to get an espresso card. We're going to make you part of the club. And we're going to deliver these things initially over the phone and then later online. And we're going to commit initially to delivering them within 24 hours to you. So you're not likely going to be out of coffee. Um, if you can't sort of you know, gauge how many capsules you have within 24 hours, well, that's probably your problem, not our problem. Um, so that was the, the decision that, uh, that they took. Um, as the market matured, they expanded a little bit on that business model. Um, they added their own name brand, their own brand machines, made, made, not made by them. They didn't decide, hey, we're going to get into the manufacturing business. But they did sort of say, hey, we're going to stick our logo on it. We're going to take on some of the design parts of, uh, of this process. 
They also added their own stores. Any of you have been to the Bay's, got an espresso store here in Toronto. So they decided to create sort of stores within stores um, uh, to, to do that. Um, really in an effort to control the sales message more, you know, to have greater control of that, uh, of that sales message. And ultimately they said, you know, we weren't wrong about the office market being uh, a viable channel for us or a viable place, uh, you know, viable customer segment for us. But we were, we, we were wrong about how we, how we sold to that market. So they revisited the topic and said, we're going to create the Nespresso Pro channel and go back at that, that office market, um, but go back at it with our new, um, you know, our new, business, um, our new business approach. It turned out pretty well. Um, you know, the, the, the pivot was, uh, well, a blinding success. Um, 30% uh, CAGR is compound annual growth rate. So over 10 years, every year, they grew 30% on the year before. And the first year, that's pretty easy to do. You know, start up kind of, start from zero. The first year, you get, near, you get infinite growth. You get a freebie there. And then in year two, um, you know, growing 30% on, hey, I did 100,000 to do 130,000, OK. But as the numbers get big, keeping up a 30% compound annual growth rate is a very, very hard uh, thing to do. Um, uh, Carrie mentioned I, I worked at BCE um, once upon a time. And uh, when you have an $8 billion, uh, you know, bottom line, 3% uh, uh, growth is victory. Um, so 30% is very, very, very hard to do. Um, they do about $3 billion in annual revenue um, uh, through, this, uh, through, this, through this model. Um, so, you know, not only are the percentages good, the, the top line dollars are, are pretty good um, from, a, from a, a, that perspective. They've sold 12 million machines um, so far, so that, uh, that worked out pretty well too. Um, 20 billion capsules. Um, uh, I've been looking for, and if, someone, if there's an engineering student or uh, someone who's good at uh, these kind of math problems in the audience, I'd love to know. I want to sort of figure out, you know, 20 billion capsules. You've seen these statistics where people say that's as much money as goes to the moon and back. Like, I'd like to know how far 20 billion capsules, uh, um, you know, strike, uh, travels. But it's a, it's a long distance. It's, a, it's an impressive uh, statistic. It's available in 50 countries. And uh, so I think, I think we can all say that that, um, uh, that pivot um, was a wild, wild success for, for, for that, uh, that company from, hey, we're going to shut it down um, to, uh, to 20 billion uh, capsules sold. Um, everybody familiar with that term when I say the pivot? Have you talked about that at all, the sort of pivoting my, my business model? Um, so this to me is a, you know, a real classic example of, of the pivot. We didn't change everything about the product. We just changed a few essentials about its business model and everything changed. You know, those sort of quick, uh, or rather not quick, but sort of those relatively simple on the surface changes in how it's delivered made, made a, a, you know, a stunning impact in the, in the outcomes. So let, let me walk you through an espresso on the business model canvas. And I, I think this will hopefully uh, you know, sort of make the, the canvas uh, alive for you. So the initial customer segment, high-end households. Um, I was talking about the segments being addressable. This wasn't for uh, you know, uh, uh, middle class. The initial target was we're going to target an upper class kind of market. We're going to aim directly. It's aspirational. It's got sort of that kind of branding around it. Um, you know, we're going to make this uh, a, a bit of a, a fashion statement to have one of these things that is a bit of a, a status symbol in, in the initial thing. All of that stems from saying, hey, we have a laser-like focus on a particular customer segment. Right? You know, they're addressable. They're nameable. You can describe them. Um, yeah, if any of you are, um, you know, are web developers or compu uh, computer science students, and so on, think of this as the persona. You know, we have a persona of the customer. This is the person for whom we're building this product. And uh, um, often a useful exercise to go as far as 
giving that customer segment a name, you know, to say this is Sally and she's, uh, uh, she graduated from Yale and uh, she lives here and she drives this and she does these things. And to make that as, uh, you know, sort of a mental image that you can conjure as a, as a marketer when you're thinking about that customer segment and say, okay, I, I, I you know, I intuit what, uh, what, that, what that segment likes. Um, so high-end households to begin. Um, what was the promise? The value proposition here is really simple. Um, and simple is good in value propositions. Um, uh, the, the crisper you can make this, the, the more succinct and the, the more uh, um, easy to understand, the better. So the value proposition is simple. Restaurant quality espresso at home. Um, and uh, I think you know, sort of coffee has gone through a, a, a transformation over the last uh, uh, 10 years, and the bar has been raised on what a good cup of coffee is. But at the start of this process, this was revolutionary. You know, sort of the only, uh, you, if you were going to make high-end espresso at home, you bought a, a machine, uh, you hoped that it had the right number of bars. It was a very complicated process, and this was simple. High-end restaurant quality espresso at home without a lot of work is probably the subtext of, uh, of, of that question. So um, if, you can, if, if you can't fit your value proposition on one of these post-its, um, keep thinking about it. Keep narrowing it down. Keep refining it. Um, shorter and pithier is, is, is better for this, uh, this job. And that, um, that brings up a point that I didn't um, call out when I, when I put up the canvas in the first place. There's software to do this. There's uh, keynote templates. There's a whole lot of ways to, you know, sort of tools to make doing the business model canvas simpler. Um, in my opinion, the best answer to this question, though, is a whiteboard and a bunch of post-it notes. Um, you know, that the simpler answer to this question is the better one for this purpose. Um, because at least at the beginning of your startup, you're going to be changing it a lot. And the, the less sort of mental resistance you have to hitting recalc on your, on your, on your thinking about this, the better. You know, you want to be able to say, OK, we went out, we talked to a couple of customers. We thought it was high-end households. They said, no, we're buying some other machine. Uh, the butler's making my espresso. I don't need one of these things. Um, you know, it's a different target audience. We're, we're going to change. And um, you want to adapt this, this document to reflect those changes in as close to real time um, as you can. Um, you, want to, you want to reflect these things in real time. One of the other fantastic things about this as a tool in an entrepreneurial environment in a startup is how many of you are part of a startup team? Um, you know, how many have a co-founder, a partner? Uh, uh, this is an amazing vehicle to communicate learning to your co-founders. Um, you know, uh, one of you is building the product, doing the research, doing those kinds of things. Someone else is out interviewing customers and so on. You come back and you say, oh, you know what? I learned this, and I update the board. And instantly, that communication is you know, sort of real there. People understand the, the change that you've made. Or if they don't, there's this big yellow post-it note that says, I better ask you know, Jim about why he changed that one. You know, it prompts a, a communication that a piece of software or a set of PowerPoints just don't. Um, and so I encourage you to take some whiteboard space and do it with, with, with in, in, that, uh, in that kind of manner. So, it's a high-end restaurant quality espresso at home. Um, the relationship here is important. The relationship that Nespresso aims to strike with me is I'm a member of their club. Right? Um, rightly or wrongly, whether that's something you aspire to or don't aspire to, the goal that they are trying to wrap around it is that you say, yeah, I'm a card-carrying member of the Nespresso tribe. Right? You know, I've signed up. I'm in, um, in, this, in, this, in this relationship. So it's not a transactional relationship. Member is the, is the word they use to describe, and that's a very deliberate um, part of that customer relationship definition. Um, the channels, um, to begin with, uh, you buy the machines at retail. You buy them uh, now in boutiques. Um, and th the second part, you buy the capsules on a website in a call center. And uh, um, one of the other things that's worth doing here is as your, as your business um, evolves or as the segments evolve, color code these things. You know, it's unlikely you're going to start with, hey, high-end households are my customer segment. But over time, that business evolves. It morphs and so on. And it's not to say sometimes you'll abandon that starting segment, but sometimes you'll add new segments. And 
you know, add the post, add blue post-its for the next segment, add green ones for the, the third segment, and, and so on, allow you to convey that. And I should have uh, color-coded the Nespresso.com and the, or the boutiques as another answer to that. Um, revenue streams. Um, capsule sales is underlined there because that's where all the money is. Um, the money for them is, um, is almost exclusively in the capsules, in the, in the sales. Not so much at a top line revenue, but at a gross margin basis. They run the machines at very close to break even. Um, and the, the profits are all in signing me up as a member of the club and letting me regularly order those things. So capsule sales is the important one. Hardware sales, a smaller one. And you know, there's just some easy ways to um, you know, indicate emphasis there by underlining the ones that are, that are material to your business and uh, capturing the other ones um, smaller. Um, what resources do you need to execute on, on that Nespresso business model? I'd say the very first one is distribution. Probably the most important thing that you have to do if you're going to a mail order business model and uh, you're doing this you know, uh, uh, more than 20, you know, almost 20 years ago now, you're making that, that, that change. Um, you better be darn good at logistics uh, in terms of how am I going to stock the right number of things, have them close enough to my customers to get them inside of 24 hours, make sure that the delivery costs are very low because I'm, you know, I'm selling, uh, it's high-end coffee, but it's still coffee. It's, this, is a, this is a, you know, 60 cent or thereabouts a capsule kind of a thing. Um, so if it costs me $6 to deliver them, uh, better rethink this. You know, I got to be very careful about about uh, what those costs are. Um, I need the patents. I need the intellectual property, the idea, and the protection that, that goes around it. I need to make them, um, simple, simple enough. And uh, over time, I need to build up a brand. I need to build up a brand promise that makes the, you know, there's 12 million of those machines sold. The first one was re probably really hard to sell. Um, the you know uh, 11 million 909 anyway uh, the 12 millionth one probably pretty easy um, so it's driven really there by by that brand promise and over time that brand makes their communications and messaging and all of those things um, much much more efficient um, for them key activities I was talking about you know on on this on this part of the the chart only the ones that make or break the business. And I think in this case, these are them. Um, you need to be very, very efficient about producing these things, uh, getting the quantities of them right in the logistics um, part of that business. You know, making sure that we have the right number, that slippage um, of those things is minimized. Uh, talking at the beginning in 19, 1998 or 1988, when they were thinking about shutting this down, the only reason they kept it open is because they had too many on the shelf. Um, having too many on the shelf in this model kills the economics of it, right? You need to balance the, the amount of inventory you have with the delivery commitments that, uh, that you're trying to make. And of course, you have to be really good at marketing. Um, you know, there isn't at the end of the day much um, fundamental difference between my hot water and ground up coffee and your hot water and ground up coffee. That's, you know, the sort of the, the degree, the range of differentiation there is relatively narrow. And so you have to be very good at marketing um, to, to execute against that, that differentiation. Who are the key partners? Um, I'd say the only key partner, lots of partners in this model, but the only one that was essential to its initial success was getting the OEMs to agree to take that leap of faith that said, all right, yeah, I'm going to make your machines even though I see none of the downstream profits, even though I'm you know, only sort of, you know, I'm selling, I'm making a one-time sale, you're making a transactional sale. And doing that, after having burned many of those OEMs on the first business model, right? You know, sort of, hey, I, you know, we, we were wrong about this for 18 years and change, and uh, but this time, trust us, we're gonna we're gonna get it right, and sort of, you know, convincing those OEM partners to go down this path um, with them, a, a very essential part of, um, you know, of, of making that uh, that pivot. Um, Last thing uh, on, this, on this chart in terms of the important elements of, uh, of, of this kind of model is the distribution and sales element. Um, you got to be, you know, that's a big cost um, for this business. It's not only a key component, it's a key driver of the P&L of, uh, uh, of that business. You guys done financial statements yet or talked about sort of, you know, profit and loss statements? So uh, when you get there, you know, these kinds of things are the big parts of, uh, of this kind of model. Um, 
Marketing, next part, is a big cost. You, don't have, you not only have to be good at it, you have to spend a fair amount of money at it to, to do this. The, the long-term sort of payback of this kind of model is potentially you know, the, the marketing spend, the cost of customer acquisition being something that you got to pay a lot of attention to. And then last, I got to make these things. I got to manufacture them. So that's the Nespresso business model on the canvas. Does that make sense? Uh, that kind of pretty clear, that grind, uh, you know, take, take, that, take that home. Um, once, once you've got this on a on a single canvas, you know, sort of your initial hypotheses about this, because uh, to me uh, and I hope to, to all of you, a startup is a, a successful startup anyway is a learning machine. Its job is to go in quest for the right answers to to this to these set of questions, you know, to the business model um, questions for, for that particular entrepreneur, that particular idea. So once you've got an initial hypothesis here, th this tool becomes even more powerful. You know, it starts with document hypothesis number one. How many of you have a business idea that you're working on? Um, so if you, take, if you go, you know, go home this evening or the next time you, you know, spare an hour to work on your business and you know, write, th write this down, fill out your business model canvas. Um, that's a, often a very clarifying process for, for, for an entrepreneur to sort of write down in one of these things, you know, here's what we think today. Um, but it's, it's a much, or it becomes even more useful when you say, okay, now take this page, and which one of these things am I sure about? You know, which one of these things am I certain about in my business model? How many of you are sure you've nailed your customer segment? All right. So not most of you, you know, a like handful of the people who said, hey, I have a business idea are sure about that answer. So, you know, circle this thing and say, all right, the next week I'm going to spend, you know, getting to truth about that, that, that customer segment. I'm going to go out, I'm going to talk to customers, I'm going to interview them, I'm going to speak with them, and I'm going to come back and either, you know, I'm right or wrong about that hypothesis of that box on the, on the chart. I've nailed that hypothesis. Move on to the next box. Move on to the value proposition, and those are often iterative. You know, the value proposition is 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 the value proposition for this segment, right? It's not the value proposition in the abstract. It's the value proposition for the high-end household. Um, so test the pair next. You know, test test the value proposition against the particular customer segment, and so on through this through through this model. Um, and one of the great things about this model, take a you know, it's talking about putting it on a whiteboard. Um, Take the picture of the whiteboard example, because there will be instances for sure where you say, okay, we changed, you know, we said we didn't think that was our customer segment, we pivoted here, and oops, you know, two steps downstream, we were wrong, and let's go back and, you know, and, and revisit the, the version that, that, that we looked at before. But this is, uh, um, any, uh, has anyone read Eric Le Reese's The Lean Startup um, book? All right. Forget doing your canvas. Next thing you should do is go read The Lean Startup. Anyway, this is a tremendous um, uh, uh, work in, in this space and sort of the science of, uh, of entrepreneurship. One of the things that he has developed and modeled um, is what he calls innovation accounting. And what he means is sort of uh, fundamentally is tracking the amount of startup investment, amount, sort of the amount of your founder energy, if you will, that you devote to, get to a given piece of learning, right? And that the, the, the the more efficient you can be about that, the faster you can learn with the resources that you have, and the more likely you are to win. Um, this is a great tool for innovation accounting, for keeping track of, I ran this experiment, I learned this thing, and now I update. Um, I ran this experiment, I learned this thing, now I update. And cycling through that loop, uh, the loop that I showed you at the, at the very beginning there, is, is, is critical to, to success, in my opinion, as a, as a startup. Um, the other thing that this is great for um, is talking to other people about your business idea. Um, you know, one of the key um, success factors for you, I suspect, as entrepreneurs, is um, you know finding the co-founder. You know, how many I asked you earlier? You know, how many of you are uh, in teams working on on your idea? 
Um, this is almost always a team sport. At least successful entrepreneurship is almost is is, a, is statistically a, a team sport. And so, you know, you want to convince me to join your team to get on the page with you as an entrepreneur. This is a don't send me your business plan. Please don't send me 192 pages of you know. Hey, this is my idea. I wish you would come and you know uh, join my team or give me your opinion or something. Take take this page. Sit down with that person who you're trying to convince you know, that you have um, got the next great um, entrepreneurial venture and walk her through this page. Right? Um, it's a tremendous tool for very succinctly going through that kind of process and um, communicating it to team members and so on. Last um, job, and uh, um, hopefully my excitement for this tool is, is shone through, but the last thing that it's great for is when you're a little farther along and you're hiring new staff. Um, you got new people joining your team. Another thing that's hugely correlated with entrepreneurial success is getting that those team members on the same page with you as fast as you can, so they understand the vision of the company, where it's trying to go, what matters to it, what's what's essential to our success. You know, what's on the these are the things we must do. These are the things we sweat and worry about um, nights about, and these are the things that eh, you know we as long as we're okay at that, we're we're fine. This is a really crisp tool for communicating that to, to team members. Once you are a little farther along. Um, on this kind of model where, you know, say two-thirds of the boxes are no longer guesses. You know, hey, they're, you know, they're slightly validated. They mostly make sense. They've survived sort of collisions with the real world with, with customers. Um, one last thing that you can do with it is you can make this visual. You can make this a reference document that lives in your, um, you know, in your, in your startup, in your, in your offices, in your, um, you know, in, in all the places where customers and employees, uh, um, shareholders, uh, all the people who sort of are part of making your brand or your business a, a reality, that we can turn it into a visual representation. And then this communicates even more crisply. You know, um, if you didn't, you didn't read the words, you didn't uh, know all those things, those pictures with, you know, as a reference are really powerful um, to say, hey, here's our business model on one page. We know what it is. It's coffee at home. It's to these kind of people. You know, they, they're sitting in front of the, this TV. Their relationship is, is this kind of membership. It's a club. Um, I think all of those things really sing when you take them and you turn them into, into, into graphics. Um, uh, I'd encourage you not to do that until you got you know a reasonable amount of certainty, um, unless you're as talented as some of uh, uh, some of the folks who do the scribing here. Uh, but uh, if you're as graphically challenged as I am, don't do this uh, until you're a little farther farther along, because uh, it'll it'll stop me. It certainly stop me from changing segment. I can't change a segment. I got this beautiful picture. But uh, um, you know you want to you want to minimize that. So that's um, you know uh, that that's really the. The, the messages I was hoping to convey to you about the business model canvas. A couple of further learning kind of things. If I've, I, I hope I've intrigued you about this tool. I haven't done it um, justice at all in terms of the, the, the power of it and the depth of thinking that, uh, that, that sits behind it. Um, but uh, I'd encourage you to go get uh, Alexander Osterwell and Yves Penier's uh, book, The Business Model Generation. Um, it, uh, it's, it's not only very... Uh, um, worthwhile from a reading perspective. It's a beautiful book, um, uh, aesthetically, and sort of the process that they went through. It's really quite, uh, uh, quite, quite worth looking at, if, even if uh, even if you didn't read it. Though I hope you'll do both. Um, the second part of the of the uh, you know second part of my uh, next steps for for you would be to read Running Lean by Ash Mora. Um, uh, we've been lucky enough to have Ash up here a couple of times uh, at Mars uh, doing workshops with us and so on. And he's taken the business model canvas, uh, which is a general tool. I mean, you know, Nespresso is not a small company. You can model it um, in it. Um, uh, I've seen lots of case studies of big, stable enterprises in it. He's adapted it and modified it a little bit specifically for the challenges of a startup, you know, for a venture where your canvas is mostly blank, or at least the facts on your canvas are mostly unknown. Um, he's done a great job of adapting the canvas to that particular challenge and for writing a, a sort of a guidebook that goes along with it about prioritizing the questions and how to frame um, those experiments to get to, 
to certainty or at least uh, uh, much less uncertainty about each of the boxes on your, on your business model. Um, the last thing I hope you'll do is come uh, back to our uh, uh, Entrepreneur's Toolkit workshops about, uh, about the business model canvas and uh, uh, fill one out for your um, entrepreneurial um, idea. Uh, we have some in January and we also have uh, the same session in May. Um, coming up, and uh, they are really great workshops. Sit down with uh, uh, fellow entrepreneurs and uh, whiteboards and markers, and uh, uh, do this for for your business with uh, you know some really effective coaching as uh, as you go through it. So I hope uh, you'll take those next steps. Um, thank you very much uh, for your time and attention, and uh, for coming to Entrepreneurship 101. Uh, Thanks, thanks, Mark. Uh, we have a couple questions that came through actually earlier in your presentation from the webcast. And I think there's some confusion on for when to use the business model canvas and when to use a business plan. So for example, one of the, one of the questions was, is the completed business model canvas a document that you should actually give or distribute to investors? Um, I think it depends on who your investors are or who the potential investors that you, you know, that you are pitching this to. Um, I doubt the Royal Bank is going to, you know, give you a, a, biz, a small business loan on the basis of, of, your, of, your, of your business model canvas. Um, there are lots of uh, angel investors I know who will happily accept a pitch deck and a business model canvas as the right answer to telling me your business model story. They likely want a set of financials. You know, there's sort of there's two parts to the business, the formal business plan. Generally, there's the the pros part about that, the you know long sentences about my guest times my wild guest times my assumption, um, and then there's a set of spreadsheets and the. Every investor I know wants the spreadsheets. Most of them are really not interested in the, the pros um, part of that. And this is an effective substitute for the pros for angel investors and Series A, you know, sort of early stage uh, money. It probably doesn't work uh, um, when, you're, when you're downstream or if you went to a bank. Um, but in either case, it's the right tool for um, worst case scenario, you, know, you have to write the business plan. This is the table of contents for the business plan, right? This is the, this is, these are the headings, these are, the, these are the, the thoughts, this is the outline, if you will, of my, of my business plan. And then, yes, I gotta be a little more long-winded about it in my, in my business plan. I gotta cite a, a few examples. I gotta get a McKinsey report and uh, um, something from StatsCan. But uh, you know, uh, this, to me, is the right tool when you're in that experimental stage. And, and I think when you, if you have a business plan, it sort of sits in on your drive or unprinted somewhere. Whereas a business model canvas, you can just put it up, and it, it is, as Mark mentioned, a living document. So you can sort of see how things have changed. It's almost like a visual reminder for your team um, yeah. of what what the original plan is, and, and it can morph over time. Um, are there any questions from the audience? If you uh, go up to the mics, that would be great because we have about 100 people on the webcast so they can hear you, can hear you better. Hi, um, great presentation, thank you. I was just curious, in your experience um, going through the business canvas models with a variety of clients, have you found any shortcomings with this tool? Um, he, there, there are things in the tool that I, um, I have a, I think in startup situations actually that the lean canvas is often a, a better answer, and the, the reason I think it's the you know sort of my my go-to tool um, is there's the missing on here is defensibility of those things is probably the the one thing in a startup case that I don't see. I mean it's it's, it's embedded in the model, but it isn't called out with the prominence that I think it deserves in a, in a startup situation. And that can either be, you know, hey, we have intellectual property that nobody else can take. We have a, 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 you know, a particular depth of knowledge of, a, of the customer segment. And so sort of where the secret sauce goes on the business model canvas isn't immediately obvious. And I think the lean canvas does a better job of that. But I, most important to me is that you pick a tool that works you know for you I don't think the tools are particularly important it's doing it in a you know in an open iterative kind of process with your team that matters what 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 format you put it in to me is a is a much less important question um, Jackie from the webcast asked a question about Nes Nespresso um, she wanted to she says that it's a great example example of pivoting 
And can you give us more details on how Expresso's management figured out that the office market was the right customer segment for them to target? Did they figure that out sort of a la Steve Blank's customer discovery approach of getting outside the building and talking to partners? Or was it just a fluke or serendipity? Um, so I, I think there's a, there's a um, we didn't. They didn't target the office market. They abandoned the office market to go to the to go to the the home market largely. Um, I don't. I don't know in the case study. It's a great question. Sort of why they picked the office market in the first place. You know what the what the thinking was and what research they did to originally pick the segment that they you know ultimately chose to to abandon. And uh, um, I'm, I'm interested in in digging into that. The sort of the pivot or the the new segment was certainly predates. Um, the, the formal thinking that goes into uh, Steve's customer discovery process. Um, but they did hold focus groups and uh, you know, in other parts of sort of customer research, though not in the formal kind of customer discovery way. Um, so I think you're learning with, from customers, but probably in a, in a less efficient, more luck kind of way than uh, Steve would, uh, would argue for. Go ahead, please. Uh, Mark, um, uh, about this canvas, uh, I find it very general. Uh, man, because there are something uh, key features like you need to know the competitors, competitor analysis, and the key differentiators, and how do we customize and localize uh, a product? Well, so um, a couple of those I'm aligned with, and a couple of them I, I, I'm not. Uh, let me give you the ones where, where I, I think it's 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 important, and where where I think they're they're less important. Um, I have yet to see a startup killed by the competition. Um, you know that almost always startups die or fail or don't get the elevation that uh, you know they they aspire to for some other reason. Um, it's not to say you don't need to be aware of the competition. You don't need to know who they are. You don't need to know their value propositions. And in fact, it can be an interesting exercise to do one of these for the bad guys. Um, you know, to say, all right, what do I think the other um, you know the other guys' canvas looks like? What the other team's canvas looks like? But I think. Entrepreneurs, you know, sort of when they're in the analysis stage, tend to overestimate the importance of the competition, and so I think it's I think it's a good thing that it's not a prominent feature on this on this model. It's not to say you shouldn't think about it, but I think it's way less important than the other parts. Um, I think your key differentiator um, better be expressible in your value proposition, you know, or it enables your value proposition depending on you know what whatever it is, um, and so I think the key differentiators are captured on the model if you've completed the canvas well. Um, Yo, thanks. You bet. Hi. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, what, what I take away from it is that the, um, the business model canvas is a great way, on the one hand, to um, invite and remind um, people with a startup idea to con to consider all of these various uh, mm -hmm. factors, yes. and also it's a great way to maintain a, a kind of a high level view of the different elements. Uh, my question is whether you have any insight on um, evaluation strategies for um, a business model as expressed in the canvas, May whether it be like some kind of narrative on how to traverse that canvas to see if it's robust. Robust or, or any mean valuation in the sense of is this a good idea? That's right. Yeah. Um, no, I mean I, I think um, I think it's a great tool to communicate what the idea is. Um, I don't think you can sort of you know directly extrapolate from the canvas. Is that a good idea? Um, I think the way you get from this is what the idea is. Is it a good idea? Is by validating each of the things on the canvas. Right? It's saying, okay, I know it's a good idea because I was right about the customer segment, and that customer segment is big enough to achieve whatever my you know my business objectives are. I was right about the value proposition. I, I went out and tested it with customers, and they said, yes, if you you know if you deliver that, I will I will give you money. Um, I you know I validated that I can build it at a price that you know that makes my spreadsheets work in the cost. Structure. I validated that I can, um, you know, sign contracts with the partners um, on on that idea. But I, I think judgment about is this a good idea or a bad idea at the idea stage difficult to. There's no 
no set path through the canvas to say, is this the, you know, the right one? I think if you're um, you know, trying to disrupt an established market, you'd look at it one way. If you're trying to um, be lower cost, you know, a low cost competitor in another, you'd look at it a different way. So I think it really depends on what the, the thesis of the, of the business is. And the tool just lets you communicate that thesis. Go ahead. Hi. Um, hi, Mark. Uh, quick question. So um, <clears throat> you recommended um, updating this uh, canvas as, you know, as much as possible. Um, so my question is, in that process of updating and um, comparing, I guess, initial biz uh, business canvas that you have mm -hmm. and taking advice or criticisms and things like this of your original visionary um, plan, yes. um, how What's some advice for um, incorporating, and I guess it relates back to that um, previous question, but advice for um, being self-critical about um, these things that you do put on the business canvas? Well, uh, I mean, I think it's important that you, you know, are um, objective about the things that you, you put on the canvas to begin with, to the best of, you know, um, all of us as entrepreneurs, part of the reason that you go down an entrepreneurial, you know, thing is because you see something that's, you know, that other people don't see. Um, so, you know, that needs to be captured in the canvas to, to begin with. But um, over time, I, I would only change it when you've run some kind of experiment that says, you know, this should be changed. Um, and I'd encourage you to to, to try and structure your learning about your, your startup in that way. You know, I have, a, I have a hypothesis, and it's a falsifiable hypothesis, right, that says my, my chosen customer segment are the, you know, let's say the one to three person, um, you know, uh, very small startups. These are the people I'm going to sell this to. I went out and talked to 15 of them, and I gave them my value proposition, and they all said, eh, not so much. Um, go change that. Right, uh, you know, and the the level of um, subjectivity in those experiments will vary a lot. You know, and you know, the these are this is not a you know to point two decimals of precision. There's lots of judgment here, but sort of the bias is let customer facts change those things rather than certainly don't let advisor opinion or you know sort of sway you. Um, let it nudge you to create an experiment to test that thing. But if you know. If, Take that advisor's piece of advice and go test it in the world, and then update your canvas. Would be my my general heuristic for that. Thank you. Uh, bet. Um, just in the interest of time, we'll take one more question, and then you guys that stood up, if you don't mind, we'll give you first chance with Mark after to ask your question privately. Cool. Sorry about that. Right. Thanks. Not a problem. With a business plan, it almost seems as you're building the business that it's death by minutia. You said 192 page or whatever. Is the real guts of, the, of doing this exercise being able to take an entrepreneur who is right at the lowest point at various stages of developing this business and being able to give them that one jolt first thing in the morning and say, OK, there's a reason why I'm doing all this. I can see it all on one page. And I know it's going to be changing along the way, but this is the reason why I'm, I'm an entrepreneur in the first place. I do think that's a big part of it. I mean, I think the tool is useful for a lot of things, but I think certainly one of its jobs is exactly that, that as entrepreneurs, well, it's people, but as entrepreneurs particularly, we focus on a particular part of the startup equation generally. I am a declared product guy. I care about the thing we're making. I care really less about who's buying it and so on. If I, if I had my druthers, I'd just get to make stuff. And you know, the rest of it would, would, would be OK. Um, and that's not a right way to run a business. And this you know, gets you out of your particular comfort zone and says, it's the sum total of these parts that make a, a, a business that wins. Right? It's the interplay of, the, of that model that, that wins. Mm -hmm. um, and sales and marketing person, similarly, you know, I care about the messaging. I don't care really what it costs to make. And same thing, jolt you out of that, um, out of that comfort zone. So I think that's a very powerful part of the of the tools, the tools value. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, Mark, for your great presentation on business model canvas. If we had a competition for the sexiest slides ever presented at Entrepreneurship One and One, I think your your slides would have won that. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks.